Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Today, we're going to look at the real and fictional worlds of robotic surgery. The 1966 movie Fantastic Voyage is often cited as the first movie to feature a sci-fi medical procedure. Writers Harry Kleiner, Otto Clement, and Jerome Bixby imagined a machine that could shrink doctors down to microscopic size so they could then be injected into a patient in order to operate on a brain aneurysm from the inside, which seems like a very complicated workaround. The 1972 movie Silent Running, we see our first robotic repair on an injured human and then came 1980 and Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. And we all watched in awe as that 2-1B surgical robot worked autonomously to attach Luke Skywalker's new robotic arm. Our collective minds were blown and visions of autonomous robotic surgery began appearing across the sci-fi spectrum. But what's happening now? in real life operating rooms. Our guest, Starla Hutton, is a VP at Intuitive, the company behind the Da Vinci Robotic Assisted Surgical Systems, currently working in ORs today. Welcome, Darla. I am so excited to talk to you. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. Um, I just can't even remember being like this excited because when do you get to come on and talk about all the things that you love? You know, sci-fi movies, um, robotic technology and surgery, all, all in the same event. So thank you, this is exciting. In Star Wars, like most of our current fictional visions of robotic surgery, Luke Skywalker's new mechanical hand is attached by a robot working on its own. In real life, are most robotic surgical devices executing tasks without human oversight? Well, you know, I think first of all, throughout the, the Star Wars series, there seems to be a really good chance that you're gonna lose a limb. Cause like in the eight movies, I think there were like eight to 10, you know, limbs that were lost. So thank goodness for those two dash one B robots, right from the Alliance. Um, I, I think what's important though about, the, about that scene, and I'll start with this is that Luke actually requested that robot because he trusted it, he knew it. Um, and so he called for the robot because he knew that there was extreme precision in the way that it would perform the surgery on his hand. He'd get good outcomes, but that he would also have no scars, little pain and a fast recovery. Um, you can even look at Return of the Sith and there's more of those same autonomous robots actually putting Darth Vader together and, and trusted um, to rebuild him. So when you ask about the robotic surgical devices today, um, executing tasks on their own or, or looking like that without human and oversight, I think it's actually a little bit of both. Um, but let me just be really clear that surgeons are always in control of the machines today. Um, there are certain tasks that we can automate with AI and machine learning um, so they can execute together surgically seamlessly, um, but they're always in control. There's three main parts of our Da Vinci system. Um, the first one is the surgeon console that the surgeon sits in. Then there's a patient side cart that gets attached to the patient. Um, and then there are robotic instrumentation. So the surgeon sits about five to 10 feet away from the patient um, where the instruments and the 3D camera get inserted through real tiny holes inside the body of the patient. I just wanna be really clear though, that surgeons are always in control today of the machines. There are certain tasks or certain instruments that can be automated with artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, but they're executing together in a seamless way with the surgeon in control. So as cool as Star Wars is, in terms of the fictional forefathers of uh, real functioning surgical robots working today, they're also kind of the descendants of, of like Robert Heinlein's short story Waldo, more than say the get this alien out of my belly autopiloted surgery that we saw in Prometheus. Oh my God, you're so right. Um, you know, that real world surgery with Prometheus with the AI robot like coming out of the ceiling and taking the alien out of Elizabeth's stomach. Um, that just made me laugh at the time because, you know, why would you spend all that time building an AI to do surgery with blood everywhere, with large incisions, with a big staple across that's gonna give her a big scar? Um, so it's probably less like Prometheus and, and more like what you're talking about with Heinlein's short story. Stories. Um, I think that's really interesting, you know, to me because he he kind of created this hard science fiction where his stories were fantastical, but he was the idea of creating this mechanical arm that could be controlled by the human at the bed. And that's really what our Da Vinci surgical systems are based on. Is that why NASA calls all those robotic tools Waldo? Um, you know, it is. I think the term Waldo actually refers 
to a remote manipulator that's controlled mechanically or even electronically. And so NASA has always been at the forefront of robotic innovation. Um, but I think it's important for you to know and, and for the viewers to know that Heinlein, he wrote that story about those Waldos in 1942. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s that that actually became a reality and they made an arm um, that could be used to handle radioactive material for industrial purposes. Um, that arm then becomes a DARPA project with the defense um, and, and NASA, and we start to see the emergence of robotic research and robotic surgery. We sort of feed on a trough of ideas. Everybody, you know, an idea gets out there and, and it has a viral, a viral uh, effect to it and they spread. And sometimes the most amazing real science ideas start in fiction and vice versa. Well, that's true, and I think that's what you saw here, right? Heinlein starts the idea, but then you have um, DARPA, who is the defense um, advanced research agency that started funding these telesurgery products, you know, these telesurgery projects. You know, can we put robotics in space? Can we put robotics in surgery? Um, they started thinking about it with, can we bring it where we could put a robot behind the battlefield line, where we could send a robot in to treat the wounded soldiers or a them, or you know, maybe even up on the moon or at the space station with the surgeon here on the ground. So all of those ideas really funded Dr. Phil Green at SRI. Um, he was at that institution back in the early 80s. Dr. Phil Green, he was doing all this research, but Dr. Gary Guthard, our CEO, was also there at the time doing this synergistic um, work on robotics. And so what was fun is that they combined all of that um, into this idea of a company that could could revolutionize surgery. And that's where Intuitive Surgical, Intuitive Surgical Inc. was born in 1995. With the exception of that one nightmare episode with the Borg, most surgeries on Star Trek are bloodless ballets of hopeful human and technological prowess that rarely even cut the patient's skin. Is that just part of the sci-fi cool factor? Or, or in real life in real bodies, is the cutting of the skin and muscles to get to the thing that you need to fix a big deal? Well, I, I think Star Trek for, for the voyage home, Dr. McCoy, his horrified reaction, you know, as he runs into that OR screaming at the surgeon. Arthur, my God, man, drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. Put the butcher knives away. You know, you don't have to drill the holes. It, it made me laugh because so many of those episodes actually made us go into robotics or become doctors and, and nurses. But I think it's those scenes like Dr. McCoy was, was saying that really is what it's all about. Fewer entry points, less trauma to the muscle and tissues, bloodless surgery with small incisions or even no incisions. Um, often offering better outcomes to patients with less disruption to their lives. I mean, if you think about open surgery, what he was trying to avoid, it's cutting the human body with a knife. Um, and when you do that, it's really intense. And I think most patients would tell you that they want to avoid that at all costs. So surgery started to evolve because of that. Um, it started with laparoscopic surgery. That was the first minimally invasive. And here we are 25 years later with intuitive creating robotic assisted surgery where you can go in through the skin and the muscle with four ports, um, three ports, one port, no port. And, and really what the beauty of is that the surgeon has all these options for the patients. So we're seeing this steady move um, kind of in the culture of healthcare away from large incisions um, to the standard of care of minimally invasive. Um, Dr. McCoy would certainly be proud. My God, what is this, the dark ages? Here, now you swallow that. And if you have any problems, just call me. All right. But but if, okay, so if you have only tiny little holes, how is the surgeon seeing anything? Well, that's what's so critical. You know, our Da Vinci endoscope has this high powered camera attached to the very, very tip of it. Um, it's inserted into the patient and then it's maneuvered or driven around by the surgeon inside the body. But that 3D HD magnified camera um, not only gives you magnified vision, but it gives you this depth perception back. So it creates this truly immersive experience, um, you know, for the surgeon while they're in there. I mean, they can see inside the patient, but 
they can see around things, in things. They can search for parts of the anatomy. Um, they can navigate the tissue planes. They can identify the structures that they see while they're inside. Um, all the while, that robot is helping them stay completely oriented to where they are. So the whole idea is that they can see through that little, little tiny hole. Um, it's kind of like you give a surgeon superhuman powers, except we can give them even more superhuman powers than magnification. Um, we can add things like Firefly, which is, is like fluorescence imaging. So you think like night vision goggles or infrared vision in, in the movies. That's what we're doing for surgeons to find tumors, to find veins and arteries. Um, it really, vision, seeing, that's what makes all the difference. So let's talk about what we're seeing because of all the fictional robotic surgeries we watched researching this episode, the brain surgery scene in Ender's Game seemed to look like the most real life version which made sense. Gavin Hood, the film's director, reached out to Biorobotics Laboratory at U Washington and asked to borrow their Raven 2 surgical robot for the scene. But that was 2013 and technology races forward. In real life, have we move beyond even the Ender's Game surgical robot. Well, we've moved well beyond that. I mean, absolutely. I, I do think it's important to say that that Raven 2 robot was really important work and it's actually real. It's an open source research robot. Um, the difference is it's never been cleared by the FDA to use it in the OR um, on animals or, or on humans. Um, but I just thought it was an interesting choice by the producers because in 2013, um, Intuitive had been around um, for quite a while by then, and our SI technology had already been used by real life um, you know, surgeons to do real surgery. And it had capabilities beyond what you actually saw in that movie. Um, I mean, you had um, being able to light up the anatomy with things like fluorescence, being able to fire like staplers and energy devices to cut and seal things. Um, we also even had um, two consoles where surgeons could sit side by side or simulation where new surgeons could train. Um, that that was 2013. So if you fast forward even just 10 years, that hardware today looks nothing like that. It's so much more integrated. And it really has to do with the fact that we have more CPU power. So we have better speed of processing, networking, cloud connectivity. And so when you put all that, you, you can progress the AI and the machine learning that goes into these robots. Um, and that really is what's making us, I think, the first sort of internet of things of the OR. Wow. Wow. It's all, it's all moving forward together. I, I have to admit something. So we, we keep talking about this term laparoscopic, and I may have even said it before that this moment right now, and I've certainly read it a lot of times and just gone right past what laparoscopic means. The Raven 2 was a laparoscopic machine. Uh, and what exactly, what exactly is that? And why is, is what's happening now better? Okay. Um, well, without giving you a history lesson, I, I do think it's important to understand kind of the origins here because it goes back to 1805. Um, Philippe Berzini, um, he was the very first one that developed like a light conductor or a way to look internally inside the body through this lit device. Um, the problem was it was made of shark skin and, and candles and, and mirrors. So it took about another hundred years to get to the point where we could actually do the first laparoscopic clinical procedure in humans. That was done by a Swedish doctor um, named Hans Christian Jacobus. Um, but it took another 60 or 70 years for us to digitalize surgery, for us to put that camera on the end of the laparoscope, Dr. Cameron Najat, and create the era of video assisted or laparoscopic surgery. Um, the problem is that there were limitations still with that technology because you're doing surgery with straight sticks with just pinchers on the end. You don't have any wrist. And you're also doing surgery with a 2D camera, so you lose all your depth perception. So, you know, for the viewers, it'd be like sticking something through a hole, and when you want to go up, you have to go down. When you want to go left, you have to go right. Um, so you're learning surgery to kind of do it backwards. Very, very difficult to scale. Some, some got good at it. So you kind of fast forward 25 years, and that's really what robotics did, is it built on those successful foundations, small keyhole surgery, instrumentation that can be inserted into the body. Body, but we put a computer between the surgeon and the patient. And when we did that, you got things like 3D vision, intuitive motion, um, and all that you really see today with robotics. 
it's really it's really allowing the surgeon to have the surgeon to have the art of surgery returned to their their hands, uh, which you know we're kind of back to the Heinlein story of Waldo and that very human desire to have super powered hands and you see it from old timey abracadabra to the ninjutsu users on Tony Stark inspired 3D holographic schematics. We humans would like our hand gestures to, re to result in very powerful real world action. But you know, real hand movement is never just a hand. And for a hand to really work like a hand, you have to have a wrist and an arm. And, uh, but the Da Vinci machine looks like it's, it's all fingers. Does it, does it have a, does it have a wrist too? Yeah, well, you could say it has wrists, but I have to tell you, it also has shoulders and elbows and wrists and fingers. Um, you know, if you look at the patient side cart, what you'll see is that, that that column is actually like the spine and the robotic arms are, you just get four of them, are, are like your kind of your shoulders and your elbows. And then the instruments that get attached are like your wrist and, and your fingers. Um, I think that the, we can't miss the fact that when you put a computer in it, you get eyes, you get a brain, you get cognition, you get synapse. And so all of that connectivity is what creates this real life kind of interaction. Um, you know, you get an eye at the end of your finger. Not only at the end of your finger. I mean, you know, you, men you mentioned like Tony Stark or iron spider armor. So it was kind of like Spider-Man and those three mechanical arms where they can see around the buildings and they can pick up and grab things. Um, very, very similar. Um, I I'll say just one last thing because I think it's important is that what I just described was our four arm multi-port system, but we can go through one port and we have figured a way to actually miniaturize that whole thing. And we can go into the body and deploy shoulders, elbows, wrists, and everything inside the body, including the eyes. And that's called our SP system. Darla, this is so sci-fi and so wonderful. What are, why, why isn't it everywhere? Is there, is there hesitation to adapt this, this technology? Well, there's not, you know, today we're on our, our fourth generation of, of platforms. Um, we have an XI, our SP that we just, that we talked about. Um, and then we have our ION. We've done 8 million procedures in just the short amount of time that we've been around. Um, but we're already in 66 countries around the world and they've written over 24,000 publications about the impact and the value of this technology. And there's more companies coming. Um, I think the future really is robotic. Prepping for the show, we dug into some 23rd century medicine as depicted in Star Trek, the original series. And, and I got to say, Dr. McCoy's sick bay seems really very 22nd century at best. Not a magician, Spock. Just an old country doctor. Yes. As I always suspected. Whereas in real life, with every year's physical, I am consistently blown away by the new imaging devices in my doctor's office. So in modern surgeries, how important are these imaging devices? Yeah, I mean, so important because the whole idea is if we can see more, always we can do more. Um, so in, in reality, all of the technology that you saw in McCoy's sickbay, you know, it's really focused on being able to see more. And we, we, a great example is our 3D imaging technology. Since you talked about the doctor's office, um, you know what a CT scan is. It's something that most um, patients get prior to going to surgery. Well, we have uh, an AI and machine learning imaging technology called IRIS. What this allows is for a 3D segment segmented imaging image to be created. That allows the surgeon to take that, put it on an iPad, and actually show the, the, the patient before surgery what exactly they're going to do, where they're going to navigate in the body. Um, and it sort of puts the patient at ease really prior. Some, some surgeons are taking it like to a whole new level where they're doing 3D printed models of your surgery so you can actually take it home. Um, I think that's really cool too. But the, the main thing is, is that that 3D segmented image can be brought in into the virtual environment, into the surgeon console. And using AI and machine learning, it can be overlaid with the anatomy. 
And when you do that, it enables that surgeon to start to know exactly where they are, to know where the tumor is, to know where they're gonna cut, what they're gonna remove before they ever touch the tissue plane. Um, I mean, it, it truly is like the ability to see beyond the human vision. And it just, it always, um, again, just makes me kind of laugh to myself because it's like that 1960 horror film, The Man with X-ray Eyes, except you, you don't really have like the experimental drops or the surgeon doesn't go crazy at the end of it. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. This must be upping the surgical game exponentially. Oh my, I mean, absolutely. And it's true for our da Vinci surgeons on that platform. Um, I think a actually greater example is our brand new platform, the ION. Um, this is really enabling a surgeon to navigate with real extreme precision. Um, they can go through small and bendy spaces that they never could before, and they do it with augmented reality. Um, you know, what, what it's like is like the fantastic voyage. Um, you know, when, 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 we, when we talked about that earlier, ION actually features this ultra thin maneuverable catheter that allows the surgeon to navigate almost like a GPS um, down to all the parts of the body. And so it uses this really super cool technology. It's, it's, it's a fiber optic shape sensing technology. Um, and what that does is allow us to get down to the smallest branches, let's say of the lung, where we can drive all the way down there. And once you're at that destination, what that allows a surgeon to do is, is biopsy something. And so you can imagine if we could biopsy a real suspicious nodule when it's about the size of a, of a couple cells and decide whether it's cancer or not, we could treat a disease so much earlier um, in the process. So it's the key to navigate with precision, um, but to do it with technology. And physicians are just going wild for this technology because they don't know where it's going to go yet. It's extraordinary, uh, really extraordinary. A woman has no place on a mission I of this kind. I insist on taking my technician. You'll take along who I assign. Don't tell me who I'm going to work with. You know, my, my dad was a surgeon, and my sisters and I grew up surrounded by doctors, but I don't remember a single one of those surgeons back in the day being female. Are things changing, and do these tools we're talking about today play a part in the changing gender balance? Oh, I'm, I'm so passionate about this because I, I remember growing up talking to my dad, too, about, about sci-fi movies and wondering why there wasn't more Sigourney Weaver and aliens, right? Um, and, but it was the same question that I asked myself when I went into healthcare, um, because you just didn't see a lot of women in medicine and certainly not a, women, a lot of women in, in leadership. And so I'm glad to see that, yes, today, you know, things are starting to change with all this inclusion and diversity initiatives. Um, but we have technology companies like us, medical institutions, hospitals, surgical societies, um, and even STEM programs, K through 12 STEM programs. I'm on the board of Shorecrest Preparatory. Um, they're trying to build up the pipeline of diverse talent in STEM. Um, and why that's important for what we do in, in med tech and robotics is because I don't wanna just have a woman doing the surgery. I want to have a female engineer. I want to have a female researcher. I want to have a female trainer or a female med tech leader or a hospital executive that's purchasing this. Um, that's what's important for innovation is putting that diversity around our innovation table so we can come up with the best ideas because we identify the right problems through creativity. I also remember my my dad telling the story that back when he was in med school, the day the cadavers came out, the number of surgeons in his class shrunk quickly. Is medical training very different with these tools? Well, robotic technology, but also telemedicine, you know, simulation, these are creating innovation milestones in adult learning. Um, I, I'm proud that in, Intuitive, I think, is leading in this space also because we're spending a lot of time thinking about how do you train surgeons, how do you train, train care teams, you know, very differently. And I could spend a whole episode talking about this, so don't worry, I won't. Um, here's what I'll tell you. We're using AR and VR to train teams um, and to troubleshoot. We're using simulation and gamification to make it fun, but to train outside 
outside of the OR. We're also using telementoring, and that allows us to port an expert surgeon into an OR virtually with a new learner from somewhere around the world where they can help that surgeon learn how to do the procedure or learn the care or teach the care team um, how to do the choreography around that. I mean, it's, it's just really outstanding. Um, but you talked about cadavers, and we're also doing some really collaborative work on creating alternative tissue models, simulated tissue models, so we don't have to use cadavers or, or animals anymore. Um, I think it's really kind of like sci-fi, right? It's, it's, we, talk to, we, we do Ender's Game, but what about um, Ready Player One or Hunger Games or even The Last Starfighter? I mean, these movies predicted that we would be training in simulated environments, and today we're doing it in reality. How did you get into this business? Huh, certainly not because I planned it. Maybe, maybe like you um, with this. Isn't that how it always happens? You know, my, my career journey, I think, has been a lot about the early lessons that my mom and dad actually taught me. Um, find your passion. Be curious. Ask a lot of questions. Um, don't be afraid. Run towards fear. And when you finally pick a path, you know, you have to be persistent and you have to learn perseverance. So I was really lucky, I think, that I had some female family members that I watched have all of those skill sets. My mom, um, also my cousin Arlene Hutton, who went off to New York as a single woman and became a playwright. Um, I went into robotics. Um, but it, it wasn't always easy because I left clinical practice after just two years and, and took this like terrifying leap into med tech. Um, I think so many people um, find that terrifying because you spend all this time training um, to be at the patient side. And so it, it, it was just important, I think, to have male mentors along the way that sort of helped me understand that my healthcare, my nursing background, instead of just treating one patient at the bedside, I could really have this kind of larger impact if I could strategically help hospitals scale robotic surgery. Um, you know, I look back after 14 years at, at Intuitive and I think about all the lives around the world um, that we have been able to impact with our technology. And I, I truly just get excited um, because robots and humans like working together side by side, um, we're, we're making an impact on this planet. And my kids tell me all the time that maybe it'll be another planet in their, in their lifetime. Unfortunately, we are out of time so much. You have to come back. You have to come back. You have to tell us about the AR and the VR. And if there's a med school movie out, you are our girl. would love to see you again. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, thank you for having me.